Welcome to Bitchy History, the irreverent history podcast whose host has been basically that one meme with the dog in the room on fire saying this is fine for the last couple of weeks, so please don't judge my lack of episodes, or I'll cry. Welcome back to Bitchy History. I know, I know, it's been a bit, I have no excuse. Well, I do have an excuse, but it would sound like I was trying to make you feel sorry for me, so let's just skip all of that and let the past be the past. The important thing is that the show is back, and today's episode is going to be a lot of fun. I didn't, strictly speaking, actually do anything for Halloween this year. I was invited to a mead tasting party a couple of nights before Halloween, and to another Halloween party at a local gay bar that I occasionally frequent. I did go to the mead tasting party. Shout out to Katie and her husband for a fantastic night. But the other party started at 10 p.m. and I'm 33 and that just wasn't going to happen. But I did dress up for Halloween and this year I decided on a nice, simple historical costume. Rosie the Riveter. She's an iconic part of Americana. We all know the poster. Rosie in her polka dot bandana proudly declaring, we can do it. Except that's not Rosie the Riveter. So let's take a little tour through the history of an American icon and find out who she really was. Now, the history can be a little bit sketchy, mostly because we don't always have exact dates of publication for some items, but I'm going to try to piece this timeline together as best I can with what I have. So let's wind the clocks back to 1941 in Toronto. Yes, we're talking about Canada while discussing the history of an American icon. Get over it. We live in a globalized world, guys. It's 1941, and a 19-year-old woman named Veronica Foster is starting her job at the John Inglis Company Limited in Toronto. The John Inglis Company built the Bryn machine gun that was favored by Canadian and British soldiers alike during the Second World War. Oh right, we actually need to wind the clocks back one more time, to September of 1939, when Canada joined the war on the side of the Allies. Because Canada entered into the war a full two years and change before America got its act together and did anything more than lend-lease and send military aid to the Allies. Back-to-back World War champs my ass. Over 10,000 Americans crossed the border into Canada to join the Canadian Air Force and Army prior to America joining the war in 1941. Let's listen to a little bit of history about that from a May 2023 NBC report. We all mark the attack on Pearl Harbor as the start of this country's involvement in World War II, but there is a growing effort to spotlight the thousands of Americans who didn't wait to join the fight against Hitler in Europe. They jumped in early to join Canada and the British forces. In a story you will only see on News 4, Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey introduces us to a Stafford veteran who's made recognizing these service members his new mission. Retired Marine pilot Michael Parkin says he grew up in a family of aviators who often gathered to watch old World War II movies. That's when he first heard his father mention a cousin, Alfred Parkin, who flew British bombers. And we'd kind of give him the side eye and say, British bomber? So your cousin was British? No, he was from New Jersey. Well, then how do you end up with a British bomber? Well, he was in the Canadian Air Force. Flash forward years later, flying his own dangerous missions, Michael Parkin found himself thinking more and more about his dad's cousin. So when his service abroad ended, he started digging, researching, getting records on Alfred from Canada's Department of National Defense. And, and they sent me his records, <clears throat> which showed that he had um, he'd gone missing on November 25th, 1942. And that started me on a, a journey that really from 2004 until today is, has been on and off, but it's never really stopped. Parkin discovered early in World War II, Canada needed pilots and found ways to secretly recruit willing Americans like Alfred Parkin. They volunteered for World War II at a time this country was still on the sidelines. They want to make a difference. They believe in causes. And think of what a cause it was when Adolf Hitler started to murder people and roll through countries. In November 1941, Alfred Parkin got his wings in Canada and headed to England to fly for the British Royal Air Force. Aboard his Lancaster bomber, two other Americans, along with Brits and Canadians. Their bombing raids, dangerous and daring. This map shows the hometowns of Alfred and hundreds of other Americans killed or missing while serving for Canada or Great Britain. 
Michael Parkin now focused on getting them the recognition they deserve. And these people haven't had their story told. Their story's been erased and needs to be told. Joining the cause, Representative Abigail Spanberger, who's co-sponsoring this bill to award the Congressional Gold Medal to all Americans who joined the Canadian and British Armed Forces during World War II. If Congress says, we recognize what these people did, this was important, that really elevates this. Parkin's highest hope? That this country would also embark in efforts to find these Americans, like Alfred Parkin, missing in action, to include them in the record. Well, these people were fighting America's war. They just fought it first. They should be on that same list. When the roster of missing Americans is red, their name should be red. Reporting for News 4, I'm Julie Carey. And it's estimated that more than 8,600 Americans served with Canada and Great Britain in World War II. Michael Parkin's efforts were first reported by the freelance star newspaper in Fredericksburg. The video that goes along with this audio is in the substack for this episode, by the way. So please take a look at that so you can see some of the really fascinating visuals that go with it. But back to Veronica Foster. Just as American women would take up jobs on the manufacturing lines once the men left for the front, Canadian women were doing the same thing. Canada had labor shortages in the wake of joining the war as well, and in May of 1941, Foster was one of thousands of women who were working in the John Inglis Company making Bren Light machine guns. Veronica would be remembered in Canadian history as Ronnie the Bryn Gun Girl. The National Film Board discovered her and made her the poster girl of their new campaign that was meant to encourage women to go to work for the war effort. The National Film Board created a series of photographs of Foster, doing her work at the factory, but also enjoying herself at the Glen Eagle Country Club, going to dinner parties, dancing the jitterbug with co-workers, and playing baseball. Before we close the door on Ronnie's chapter of this story, I'll tell you what happened to her after the war. She became a vocalist for the Canadian band Mark Kinney and his Western Gentlemen. There she would meet George, the band's trombonist, and fall in love. She'd pursue a career in modeling before finally settling down to marry George. George died in 1963, but Veronica would raise her family and live until 2000, when Canada would put her face on a stamp to honor her contribution to the war effort. Here's a clip of her singing with the Mark Kinney band. And now Veronica Foster with the familiar strains of the sweet ballad, True. Now, I bring up Veronica for one very important reason. The most well-known and circulated image of Ronnie the Bryn Gun Girl seems to be the one in which she's pictured with her hair tied up in a headscarf, wearing a worker's uniform, and smoking beside a Bryn machine gun. Not an exact match to the iconic We Can Do It poster from 1943, but it's a close one for certain. And it's important to note that the woman in the 1943 We Can Do It poster was not given a name. Moreover, she wasn't a general propaganda poster for the United States. Rather, the poster was produced in 1943 by J. Howard Miller for the Westinghouse Electric Company as an inspirational poster to boost the morale of female employees. We Can Do It was a popular slogan at the time, possibly inspired by the song We Did It Before and We Can Do It Again, which was written right after Pearl Harbor in 1941. December 7th, 1941, our land of freedom was defied. December 8th, 1941, Uncle Sam replied. We did it before and we can do it again and we will do it again. We've got a heck of a job to do, but you can bet that we'll see it through. We did it before and we can do it again. The We Can Do It poster that we all think of these days wouldn't become appropriated by the feminist movement until the 1980s, but we'll talk about how and why that happened in a minute. For now, let's talk about where the name Rosie the Riveter came from. 
1942, lyricist Red Evans and John Jacob Loeb would publish the words and music to a song titled Rosie the Riveter, and as far as I can tell, they were the first to use the name. The Paramount Music Corporation released the music book for the song, and it would go on to be recorded by several different musical groups, like Kay Kaiser and the Four Vagabonds. The Four Vagabonds version is my favorite. All the day long, where the rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie. The riveter keeps a sharp lookout for sabotage, sitting up there on the fuselage. That little friend can do more than a male can do, Rosie. The riveter, Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie. Charlie, he's a marine. Rosie is protecting Charlie. Working overtime on the riveting machine When they gave her a production knee She was as proud as a girl could be There's something true about red, white, and blue About Rosie <laughs> The Riveter The song is said to have been inspired by Rosalind Palmer, later Rosalind Palmer Walter, who was recruited at the age of 19 as an assembly line worker at the Vought Aircraft Company. She worked the night shift driving rivets into the metal bodies of Corsair fighter planes at a plant in Connecticut, a job that had almost always been reserved for men prior to this. Rosalind was from a very wealthy family and went on to be a major philanthropist and one of PBS's principal benefactors. So you go, Rosie. Good for you. She died in March of 2020 at the age of 95. If you grew up watching PBS like I did, you've probably seen her name before, with significant foundation support from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation and viewers like you. This week, Rosalind P. Walter, one of the most generous and devoted supporters of PBS programming, including the NewsHour and NewsHour Weekend, died at age 95. Her name has been a constant on the credits of programs like American Masters, which she helped launch, to great performances, to Ken and Rick Burns documentaries, and dozens of other programs since the mid-1970s. Rosalind P. Walter served as a trustee at WNET for more than 30 years and became the station's most generous individual supporter in its history. But most people don't know that Rosalind P. Walter was also the inspiration for a 1942 hit song, Rosie the Riveter, and the posters honoring the women who worked in U.S. factories during World War II. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie. The Riveter. In the early years of World War II, Roz worked as a Riveter on the night shift at a Long Island aircraft plant making the Corsair fighter planes. They um, had to find out where the women could earn the same pay by doing the same job, so they timed me after I'd learned them all. and. I uh, broke all the men's records. They had to pay the women the same amount. She was never known as Rosie, always Roz, but the song was born. Rosalind P. Walter was born into a privileged, wealthy family. Her father was president and chairman of the pharmaceutical company E.R. Squibb and & Sons, and her mother was a well-known educator, poet, and writer. But her parents refused to allow Rosalind to attend college. She once said that she chose public television as the focus of her philanthropy because she, quote, wanted all Americans, whether they were rich or poor, well-educated or not so well-educated, to have equal access to news and knowledge and the arts. Her legacy is ours to carry on. Thank you, Rosalind P. Walter. But the cover art for the songbook for Rosie the Riveter isn't the only place Rosie appeared in popular culture. A few months after the song began making the rounds, artist Norman Rockwell would create the cover for the May 29, 1943 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. He would ask a 19-year-old Mary Doyle Keefe, who was in fact a phone operator, not a riveter, to pose for the painting. According to the Norman Rockwell Museum website, Rockwell painted his Rosie as a larger woman than Keefe actually was, and he later phoned to apologize to her for that. I suppose it might have made Keefe a little self-conscious, but honestly, the image is iconic. It features a brawny, muscular, red-haired woman in overalls taking a break from riveting to eat her lunch with her riveting tool slung across her lap. Her lunchbox has her name, Rosie, written across the front. Her nose is turned up defiantly, and her feet... Well, her feet are using a copy of Mein Kampf for a footstool. Rockwell based the pose in his painting to match Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel painting of the prophet Isaiah. The post cover image proved to be hugely popular, and the magazine ended up loaning it to the U.S. Treasury Department for the duration of the war for use in war bond drives. 
and in 1944, Rosie would make her way to film. Rose Will Monroe, a riveter at the Willow Run Aircraft Factory in Michigan, became another Rosie when actor Walter Pidgeon discovered her that year and tapped her to appear in a film to promote war bonds. As for what happened to Rose Will Monroe, at the conclusion of the war, Monroe left the factory and worked as a cab driver, operated a beauty shop, and launched a construction company known as Rose Builders, specializing in luxury homes. During the war, Monroe had aspired to become a pilot and work transporting aircraft parts around the country, most likely as a member of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP. Unfortunately, her status as a single mother caused her to be passed over for the training. Eventually, Monroe was able to achieve her dream of flying when she was in her 50s, though, joining her local aeronautics club as its only female member. In April of 1944, Republic Pictures released a full-length movie titled Rosie the Riveter, set in a California defense plant and starring actress John Frazee as Rosalind Rosie Warren. The film's not particularly easy to come by. I guess for some reason, archiving a B-movie musical from 1944 wasn't seen as all that important, but it is floating around on the internet in a few places. There's a link to one clip from it in the, you know, it's in Substack. That's where all the links always are. So there's a lot of Rosie the Riveters in this period of time. Why did the one version that was never named Rosie become the icon we all associate with the name today? The Westinghouse poster was not associated with any of the women nicknamed Rosie who came forward to promote women working for war production on the home front. According to the poster itself, it was only displayed from February 15th to February 28th in the Westinghouse factories, after which it disappeared from history for about four decades. Honestly, the entire thing is Norman Rockwell's fault, hoist by his own petard, as Hamlet says. The answer to this whole question can be given in a single word. Copyright. All of Rockwell's paintings were copyrighted, and while I love copyright, it did mean that while the value of that one single painting increased by leaps and bounds, it last sold for nearly $5 million in 2002, it did lead to it losing much of its cultural cachet. On the other hand, Westinghouse Electric and J. Howard Miller apparently weren't that worried about copywriting what amounted to one of those shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars inspirational posters that you see in every guidance counselor office in every high school in America, which made it a lot easier to reproduce and parody the poster. In 1982, the We Can Do It poster was reproduced in a Washington Post magazine article about posters in the National Archives collection. And once it was rediscovered, it became an icon for the second and third wave feminist movement. Coincidentally, 1982 was also the year that the Equal Rights Amendment fell three states short of ratification. Thank you so much, Phyllis Schlafly. So thanks to a zealous defense of copyright by Rockwell and his estate, the Westinghouse poster is the one that appears everywhere today and not Rockwell's. The Washington Post once called it the most overexposed souvenir item available in Washington, D.C. It's on mugs, t-shirts, keychains, pens, and even on people's bodies as tattoos, which might seem a bit excessive, but can a woman who's planning a Taylor Swift lyric tattoo really throw stones? So who was the real Rosie the Riveter? Is it Ronnie the Bren Gunn Girl, Rosalind P. Walter, Mary Doyle Keefe, Rose Bill Monroe? I think the point is, and I'm pretty sure most of these ladies would agree with me, that Rosie wasn't any one woman. She was every woman. She was an icon that stood for every woman who joined the war effort, and she's an icon that stands for every woman who demands equal rights and freedom today. And on that note, I'd like to end the show today by raising a toast to Ohio voters who showed up and made the right to access abortion care part of the state's constitution. Abortion is health care. And abortion access is the law of the land in Ohio. Good for you, Ohio. Good for you. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie. Thank you for tuning in to hear me bitch about history again. The show is transitioning to releasing on Thursdays, partly because I just really want my Sundays to be extremely lazy days where I do nothing but play video games and zone out, and partly because I read some questionable demographic research that said Thursdays at 8 a.m. Eastern are the best time to release a podcast. Who knows if they're right, but I'm going to give it a shot. Which means that the next episode will be out on November 16th, and we'll finally be getting to that Satanic Panic episode that I promised you guys in October. 
And then for Thanksgiving, I'll be re-releasing the Truth About the First Thanksgiving episode from much earlier this year on the 23rd. That one will probably make everyone at your family Thanksgiving very, very uncomfortable, so make sure to play it for them while you get the turkey basted and let me know what happens. I like stirring the pot, and it's just me and my parents for Thanksgiving this year, so I have to live vicariously through your Thanksgiving drama. And as a reminder, please share the podcast with everyone you know, and remember to subscribe to the podcast Substack for additional content. Have a great week, and I'll see you back here next Thursday.